Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who's joined in today. It's a pleasure to have you all uh, on at this session today on Green Bonds, a South-South Exchange from Lessons from Asia and Africa. It's a privilege to collaborate with the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, as well as the Africa Let's Partnership on this. Um, I am Pratima Kela uh, from the Asia Let's Partnership, uh, welcoming you all for this session today. Moving on, I'll just give you a little brief on the agenda uh, for today. So we will have a brief introduction by my esteemed colleague uh, from the Africa Let's uh, Partnership uh, sharing with us uh, about the Let's Global Partnership Finance Working Group, as well as a little bit about the regional platforms that we all represent. This will be followed by our uh, co-chair for the Finance Working Group of the Let's Global Partnership, Ms. Joanne Manda. Uh, who is also the senior SDG invest, uh, investment advisor for the UNDP uh, based out of um, um, Pretoria, um, South Africa. Uh, then we will welcome you to uh, an ice-breaking session, which we all uh, are eager to participate in. Um, and then following this, we will have a sharing of the insights um, from green bond issuers that um, have been uh, a study that has been conducted in Kenya, as well as in India, uh, by Ms. Megan Sejo, uh, who is from the Consulting of Sustainable Solutions based out of South, South Africa. Uh, this will be followed by a few reflections on green bonds market um, in India and overcoming uh, challenges, uh, which will be uh, presented by Mr. Sandeep Bhattacharya, who is uh, from the Climate Bonds Initiative based out of um, India. Uh, this will be then followed by a Q&A session where I welcome all you participants uh, to join us and to share your um, insights as well and any further questions that you might have for our uh, speakers and other topics that you are interested in uh, regarding green bonds. Um, so with this, I would now move on to the housekeeping rules. Um, so uh, just to give you a brief, uh, participants will be on mute mode for most of the session. Um, however, you are most welcome to put in your questions in the Q&A box, which you will see at the bottom of your screen. You may also raise your hands if you would like to directly ask a question um, to the speaker. Uh, we will have a designated Q&A session where uh, you will be able to um, ask your questions directly um, to the speaker. So please uh, keep your questions ready for that session. Uh, we will be using the AHA slides, which are which is the interactive platform um, for the ice breaking session. Um, so we, I uh, encourage you to please participate in this, and we will send you a bit of the details um, following uh, the session. Um, and also, we welcome you to please uh, fill up an evaluation form after the session, as this will greatly help us uh, to understand the effectiveness of this um, session, as well as to uh, help us to identify further information and further activities um, that will support you and uh, help you along in your journey for achieving um, your climate change goals. So uh, with uh, no further ado, I would now like to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Josh Oganda from the Africa Less Partnership um, to take over. Thank you so much. Over to you, Josh. Thank you so much, Pratiba. Could you please um, allow screen sharing for my side? You can now share your screen. Thank you very much. I hope you can all see my slides. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Shogad, and I'm the Secretariat Lead at the Africa Leds Partnership uh, based in Cape Town, South Africa working out of an organization uh, called South South North. Um, my role today is just to do a very quick introduction and background to LEDS GP, uh, as well as the Africa LEDS Partnership. So the Af LEDS Global Partnership was launched in 2011. Last year, we were able to celebrate our 10th anniversary. And uh, this was uh, set up as a platform for peer learning and collaboration. 
Uh, it is a network that uh, for peer learning and technical collaboration and information exchange um, in the different regions across the across the world. Uh, and one of the aims is the, uh, the implementation of ambitious low emissions development strategies and support to NDCs across different countries. Our work is very much uh, demand driven and based on country uh, country level work, and the focus of that is to build uh, capacity of practitioners in the lead space. Uh, we have three different regional platforms, uh, two of which are represented here today: the Africa Leads Partnership, Asia Leads, and we also have the Leads Latin America and Caribbean uh, Partnership as well. Uh, the LEDS Global Partnership uh, works through a number of um, uh, action areas, uh, those being uh, one energy, um, then we've got transport, we've got the agriculture, forestry and other land use sector, and we've also got finance as a cross-cutting uh, theme that runs across our work and undergirds our action areas. So the, uh, we work primarily through communities of practice, um, which focus on specific topics such as e-mobility, uh, mini grids, uh, private sector engagement, bioenergy, clean mobility, green bonds, uh, a follow which has a couple of communities of practice under it, as well as others that emerge based on the demand and the needs of uh, our members in different countries and regions. Um, very briefly about the Africa Leds Partnership. We are, as I mentioned, we are one of the regional partnerships under the Global Partnership. Uh, was set up in 2012. So this year we're going to be uh, happily celebrating our 10th anniversary. Uh, we are spread across across 33 African countries with a membership of over 600, and within those 600, we have got representatives rep representatives from government, uh, from the private sector in the form of project developers, um, academic and research institutions, as well as non-governmental organisations. And the work that we do uh, in the Africa Lens Partnership, as well as across the different uh, regional partnerships, is undergirded and supported by um, an energy working group. A working group specifically on a follow and of course the finance working group that is uh, uh, supporting this work that we're doing today and that we'll be hearing from. The mission for the Africa Leads Partnership is to promote low carbon emissions, climate resilient development uh, in support of poverty alleviation, job creation, and environmental management on the continent. Uh, the specific objectives are to promote information exchange and coordination, uh, to cultivate and support lead champions working in different sectors across the continent, and of course, to enhance capacity for design and implementation of low emissions development strategies across the continent. Our regional focus is specifically around strengthening membership and the engagement of our members, uh, building strong partnerships within the region and collaboration with different institutions. Um, we work, um, a lot of the work that we do is under the energy action area, which is, um, so, which is uh, done through the African Mini Grids community of practice. Practice. Then we also work um, under a follow um, for specifically around accessing finance for LEDs implementation. And under that, we have a livestock community of practice, as well as a community of practice on soil organic carbon, which we are setting up at the moment. And then there's, of course, mobilizing invent investment for NDC implementation uh, that we work strongly with our members across the different uh, work areas. Just to mention very quickly that in addition to that, we are also looking at the agriculture and energy nexus in some of the work that we're doing within the communities of practice. So just to talk very quickly about the, the NDC finance community of practice, which currently has over 50 members spread across nine different countries um, of the Asian uh, continent. Uh, the focus areas are blended finance, green bonds, and carbon markets. Just speak very briefly about the objective. The NDC Finance Corp addresses financial, policy, and technical challenges to accelerate investment flows into NDC implementation across the Asia Pacific region. Um, works to identify key barriers to mobilizing investments in climate initiatives, uh, to develop quick response politi uh, political, regu uh, regulatory, and capital markets interventions that center on green bonds, blended finance, and carbon instruments to address those barriers, and also works to coordinate to partner country governments and other groups to implement and identify inter interventions and solutions in a targeted and cost efficient manner. Some of the work that has been done uh, and some of the outputs that have come out of the, uh, the finance community of practice was a case study on green bonds in India, which was uh, produced in April of uh, 2020. 
There was a webinar held on readiness uh, framework for green bonds also on, uh, in April of 2020. Then of course, um, um, there was a green bonds de deep dive training that session that was uh, done in collaboration with the Cl Climate Bonds Initiative that was held towards the end of 2021. And of course, we are having this exchange now uh, between Asia and Africa uh, centered around uh, the green bond markets. Um, there have also been other outputs, including um, uh, different case studies, as well as uh, training that happened around the carbon uh, markets um, at the beginning of March this year. So just to talk a little bit uh, very briefly about the strategic focus going forward, um, obviously be, um, we are planning to have a deep dive uh, to the Asia-led partnership member countries on the uh, framework for green bonds issuance. Um, organize, we plan to continue organizing knowledge exchange sessions between the different sectors. Uh, there will be more deep dive support to uh, around carbon strategy, uh, carbon market strategies and action plans. And of course, to uh, continue organizing knowledge sessions uh, with emphasis on the involvement of the private sector in channeling investments in achieving the climate goals of different countries. Um, just to give um, a very briefly um, the details that you have on screen, we'll, which will also be shared in the chat for the uh, asia led Partnership Secretariat, and we will also be sharing some details on the africa led Partnership if anybody needs to contact us to, uh, to speak more about this. I think with that very brief introduction, of course, if there are any questions, we will welcome them. We can have them in the chat or later in the Q&A session, but I will hand over back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, we should now move on to having our uh, esteemed co-chair of the Finance Working Group, Ms. Joanne Manda. Um, just a little introduction about her. Ms. Um, Joanne is the Senior SDG Invest Investment Advisor at UNDP Africa Finance uh, Sector Hub, supporting countries undertaking the SDG investor mapping exercises and developing partnerships to advance SDG alignment investments across the continent. Uh, she has pioneered, pioneered the UNDP's work on innovative financing solutions, such as green bonds, Islamic finance, blended finance mechanisms for energy and other in infrastructure projects, while also working with private sector partners in the investment uh, impact investment space. Um, it is my privilege to uh, welcome you, uh, Joanne, for this session and over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pratiba. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, part of the role of the LED GP is in sharing best practice and um, experiences across the globe uh, around financing um, low emissions development strategies. And so it's um, really good to be able to have this session on uh, green bonds. Um, one of the things I wanted to share this morning was around how UNDP is actually um, advancing in this uh, area of work. Um, it has, has not always been a traditional area for UNDP, um, but we have started developing partnerships both with governments and with the private sector um, to support our governments to try to source um, capital from the private sector and from capital markets. And so that's how the thematic bonds um, uh, came about. Uh, in UNDP, we call them thematic bonds simply because we're starting to see a proliferation of different types of bonds, um, not just um, green. There's blue, there's SDG bonds, uh, there's gender bonds. So there's a proliferation of this tool, but for different uses. And particularly in the wake of COVID, <clears throat> we've seen a growing number of um, these uh, instruments being issued for social impact. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we are doing as UNDP. <clears throat> can you see my screen? Yes, we can, but it's not in the slide channel. Is it in slide share mode now? Um, no, not just, just see, uh, you can press the icon at the bottom on the slideshow. Oh, I have, so I think it's just a delay. Ah. Um, Let me try this again, sorry. 
My apologies. I'll skip a few slides. Does that work? I can see it, but uh, do you want me to share my screen? No, it will be faster this way. Let me um, try it again. Does that work now? No. Okay, maybe you can share it from your side and now we'll make it faster. So, um, it worked before when we tried, so my apologies. Um, so let me just, um, is this okay? Yes. Right, great. So let's start with what is a thematic bond? I think we've, we've all are aware of, of um, what a green bond is, but we're looking at a debt instrument just like any other bond that is issued either by a government, um, call that a sovereign bond or by a corporate, um, where the proceeds are exclusively targeted to financing new or existing green social uh, or blue uh, projects. Um, they hold this, the, the same rating as, as for the issuer so that the burden of the debt repayment lies with the issuer, not with the projects. And they are governed by a number of globally agreed principles. Um, um, so for example, the ICMA green bond um, principles, the social bonds principles and sustainability bonds principles. And these are globally uh, approved. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, why would we want to issue a thematic bond? I think what we're finding across our various countries is that um, issuing a thematic bond not only gives you access to the capital market, but often it's a political sign, it's a political signal um, so that the uh, issuer um, can um, articulate some of their policy um, um, objectives. So when a government wants to show its commitment to its climate change, um, <clears throat> uh, strategies, for example, Nigeria in 2017 issued the Africa's um, first sovereign climate bond, um, green bond, um, and, uh, uh, and so on. And so that's, it, it's a political sign. Um, there is a rapidly growing uh, green bond market, um, having increased um, from 250 billion in 2020 and just within the last year uh, to over um, 488 billion in 2021. And I'll, I'll come back to some of the market trends that we're seeing. Um, another reason why a thematic bond is a great thing to do is um, because it actually gives you a diversification of your investor base. Many ministries of finance, and this applies even when you're a corporate, but ministries of finance are, uh, are very keen to have a much broader um, in investor base whether domestically or internationally. And you have now a growing number of investors who are dedicated to green or impact portfolios and assets. Um, it also ensures a little bit of investor loyalty and what we call a stickiness. Um, most of these green investors are prepared to invest for the long term. And I think that's always a good thing the ministries of finance look for. And again, um, as a final thought, because of the fact that the use of the proceeds is targeted towards specific impacts, then you've got uh, debt with a purpose. Next slide, please. Um, there are four core components as always, um, the use of proceeds, which really is um, um, an articulation of what the bond will be spent on. Um, and, um, uh, there is a clear process for project evaluation and selection, um, that there's a clear process for the management of the money itself so that you can track it, um, and a, str um, a very strong emphasis on the reporting um, side, especially on impact reporting. And often with the green automatic bond, you're expected to produce an annual um, report. And these are sort of the four main components that kind of distinguish a green or thematic bond from uh, other sort of traditional bond instruments. Next slide, please. Here, I've just given you a little bit of a sample 
of what kind of eligible green projects there are. A climate bonds initiative, and I, um, many of you may be aware of them, they do green bond certifications, but they also have a very comprehensive taxonomy of potential green bond projects. So it will be easy for you to kind of identify what qualifies it as green and what uh, your green bond uh, can um, be issued as. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I wanna give you a little bit of a market update and I'll go through these slides a little bit quickly and conscious of our time. But what we're seeing uh, across the green bond or uh, thematic bond market has been an upsurge in bond, green bond issuances. Um, the very first green bond was issued by the World Bank in 2007, um, uh, 2008, somewhere there. But um, we've seen a, a, a rapid increase in um, green bond issuances uh, between 2013 uh, and all the way to well over 400 billion worth of issuances uh, in 2021. And I think um, we'll see an increase uh, of, the, of the issuances um, as we go forward as well. There is a huge appetite um, within the investor uh, market. Um, what this slide shows is also that there's an, um, a growing increase, um, certainly from 2018 onwards, and particularly driven by the COVID crisis, a growing interest, uh, increase in sustainability bonds, social bonds, and sustainability-linked bonds. And I think that's because as governments have been managing the fiscal space uh, in terms of COVID recovery, they've issued bonds um, to raise um, capital on the market. Next slide, please. Um, so basically, the sustainability bond issuance has is, is been uh, diversifying uh, over time. I think we can skip this slide, Pratiba, go to the next one. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, up to about 15% of, of 2021's issuances um, were uh, sustainable bonds. Um, and that's quite a significant shift in the, in the, um, uh, in the market. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about how UNDP actually engages on this area um, and cover some of the steps of a green bond issuance. Um, it's quite simple. I think anybody who has um, uh, some experience in the financial market and has looked at uh, bond issuance, generic uh, bond issuances, will be very familiar with this cycle. But within a green bond, uh, I mentioned earlier those four additional steps um, in terms of identifying the right kind of projects. But in terms of the, the steps of the bond issuance and where UNDP actually provides support, both to government, sovereign or sub-sovereign, and also to um, you know, corporates um, and uh, municipal governments and so on, um, we engage with the government, particularly right at the beginning when the decision as to whether or not uh, to issue a bond is being made. And I think this is an important policy and political uh, conversation that is required uh, before a government steps into creating a green bond uh, cycle. Um, once a decision is made, the next step is to develop the green bond framework. And again, UNDP works very closely with different governments to develop those frameworks. Um, a, frame, a green bond framework is essentially just the marketing tool. Um, and it's usually a short report, um, no more than 10 pages, that goes out into the market as the sort of um, offer for, for the market. Um, and once um, the, the framework is uh, outlined and it usually identifies the national priorities the, that the government wants to achieve and the potential areas for which the green bond um, uh, proceeds will be um, spent, um, the third step is to then actually identify the eligible budget items or the eligible projects, uh, depending on which stakeholder you're dealing with. Um, and then uh, getting an independent external review of uh, both the framework and of the bond. Um, so there's, there's kind of a double, there's two areas here where you, you do a second opinion of the framework, which then means the market is ready to kind of utilize that. The bond then goes um, to into an issuance process, mostly within a financial institution. UNDP is not a financial institution. So we tend to partner with different banks 
Um, and we also sometimes um, engage with, you know, the likes of the World Bank who are already um, supporting governments as well in the structuring, the financial structuring of the bond. Um, but that's steps uh, five. Um, and then once the bond has been um, issued on the market um, and the money raised, um, we then step back in to support the government with uh, monitoring and reporting, um, uh, facilitating uh, the annual audit of the bonds um, and so on. And then the cycle repeats. Next slide, please. So that's just to explain what the cycle looks like. And of course, from UNDP support, um, we, we, um, um, one of the areas that we are finding this huge demand, especially with government uh, uh, sovereign issuers, um, is around the selection of the eligible green, uh, green projects. There's still a lot of capacity building required. Many governments um, want to know um, what kind of projects would qualify um, and are still on a learning curve around that. Um, many governments have um, NDC targets and, and, and so on. And so we help to unpack that and make sure that um, uh, number one, there is a clear uh, transparent system for project selection. Um, there is a clear uh, um, uh, uh, reporting um, and a clear um, uh, program for the tracking of the use of proceeds and some of in some of the governments that we've dealt with we've actually instituted a, a tag in the national budget so you end up with a green bond um, a, a green uh, um, uh, uh, tag within the budget the national accounts and um, we then um, work with um, supporting the line ministries that are receiving the bonds themselves to actually align with the uh, potential reporting that's coming downstream. Next slide. I've mentioned this and, uh, and talked about the monitoring and, and reporting. One of the key offers that we're actually, um, um, if you go back to the, the slide before on the SDG impact, next one, Pradeepa. Um, I want to end on this one. Um, uh, one of the key offers that we have actually within UNDP is now starting to develop a very clear um, impact standards for bond issuers. And um, this is to support uh, governments, in fact, to support the entire financial market um, with regards to reporting on sustainability and, uh, and impact. Um, and we are developing um, bond uh, um, uh, standards um, and, but going beyond just uh, impact standards for bond issuers, we also have impact standards for um, enterprises and equity funds. But the idea is to provide a, a taxonomy that will allow governments to really uh, be able to articulate um, and use the right metrics for uh, reporting on uh, the impact. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, go to the last slide, I think. I think that's, uh, that's it. I just wanted to say quickly that on the African continent, um, um, if out of the sort of 500 billion um, bond issuances that have happened globally, Africa holds 0.4% of that <laughs> uh, figure. And so I think there's a lot that Africa needs to do to catch up. Um, over the past, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, six to eight years, uh, there have been 17 green bond uh, issuances across Africa uh, from six, primarily six countries, South Africa, Morocco, Nigeria, Seychelles, Namibia, and Kenya. And of those six countries, uh, South Africa, Morocco, and Nigeria hold 97% of the value of the issued uh, green bonds. Benin has been the first sovereign actually on the African continent to issue an SDG bond, which they did last year, 2021, to the tune of about um, 500 million euros. So, um, you know, let me just end with the thought that this is actually an emerging uh, area for Africa. There is strong appetite across the continent for this, but I guess there's also need to balance um, the issuance of bonds with broader debt management um, considerations. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you for giving us a basic understanding of what 
a, a green bond is a, in, in UNDP words, a thematic bond, um, and also uh, helping us to understand the market scenario at the moment and also in the situation in Africa. Uh, before we move on, um, we would also like to understand a bit about uh, the audience at this point and um, also what your um, interests are, particularly going forward uh, with regarding to uh, green bonds, from what perspective uh, you are keen to look at green bonds. So I'll just uh, quickly share my slide. And um, yes. Um, so if um, participants can maybe scan this code or uh, go on to the link, which is ahaslides.com slash 2EC12. I'll also um, put this, sorry, on the chat box. And there are two questions. Um, one being, which region are you from? So we'll get a better understanding of um, the, where our participants are from. And the second question is that, what level are you interested in green bonds? So in terms of the key stakeholders that are involved in the implementation of green bonds in the region, would you, are you interested in from the perspective of an issuer? Are you interested at looking at green bonds from the perspective of an investor or any other um, key stakeholders that are involved so that uh, you have the creditor, auditors, the regulators as well, or are you interested in uh, looking at the international standards or supporting policy um, for green bonds? So it will be, um, I'll now move on maybe to the, just to the results, if we can get them up. Yes, I've got a couple of results, so I'll just share my screen. So surprisingly, at the moment, we have 100% from Africa. Uh, interestingly, anybody else? Our colleagues from Asia, although it's quite early in the morning in Africa, I can see that Africa is quite active. We'll just wait for a couple of more minutes for results from Asia as well. While that comes in, moving forward, we'll just see uh, from which area you can still log in through this ahaslides.com, even if I can't share my the barcode. Yeah, I'll just put in the link in the chat. Hi, Pratib. I think you might need to um, allow submission of resp uh, responses on this. It says submission closed for this next question. Okay, just give me a second. Sorry about that. Ah, there we go. It's open now. Thank you. Yep. Okay, great. So we have a couple of uh, participants who are keen to look at green bonds from the perspective of uh, issuer, so any bonding uh, authority, whether it's a government or a corporation or a bank, and then we have other key holder, holder, uh, key stakeholders. Sorry, um, so we have the regulators. If you would like to be an underwriter or uh, looking at credit rating systems. And then of course we have the international standards and 
us as the African Let's Partnership, the UNDP and um, Asia Let's Partnership, mostly as supporting entities, helping governments with development of frameworks for green bonds. Great, so thank you so much for this. And uh, we'll now move on um, to the rest of the session. And I would now like to introduce to you Ms. Megan Sejo. Slide, sorry. So Ms. Megan Sejo is, if you can, can you see my uh, the slides? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, Ms. Megan has an over a decade of experience in strategy and innovative finance, developing catalytic solutions for leading banks, equity investors, and development finance institutions. Uh, these include green bonds, pay as you save loans, so, uh, social and affordable housing and property loans. She's also participated in policy research for clients, including the WWF, the World Bank, and the South African government. Prior to find, uh, uh, founding the Center for uh, Sustainable Solutions in 2014, uh, Ms. Megan worked for Ned Bank, McKinsey and Company, and Philips Lighting in primarily st uh, strategy and business development roles. She's passionate about business unusual, harnessing the power of private capital to achieve profit with purpose. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today, uh, Megan. And we look forward to your session on uh, the study that you've conducted for, Ish, uh, for India and Kenya. Thank you so much. Over to you, Megan. Thank you very much, Pratiba. And uh, it's wonderful to share uh, a few thoughts with this um, fantastic group of individuals on the line today. Um, wonderful also to see some of those that we interviewed um, during the process uh, of, of research, including Sandeep, who I believe will be speaking a little bit later. Um, so really, the, the research that we undertook for the Climate um, Development and Knowledge Network was focused on understanding in greater detail the opportunity to unlock green bond markets in developing countries. I think Joan has laid out very clearly and well um, the opportunity associated with this uh, new segment of the bond market, but also the very small um, quantum of proceeds currently flowing into some of the world's least developed economies. So we wanted to understand better what would be required to succeed. Um, just in terms of others who participated with me on this research, um, Kamleshan Pele, who um, is, is also a South South North expert, along with Gareth Watson, Laura Rabinowitz, and David Hazel from the Sustainable Solutions team. Um, and this research was conduct conducted over several months in 2021. So a little bit about sustainable solutions. Um, we're a sustainable finance advisory and consulting group of firms based out of Cape Town. Our mission is to unlock capital for sustainable cities. We have two arms, um, a consultancy arm, which is focused predominantly on um, financial intermediation and mechanisms that allow capital to flow. And then a more recently developed uh, firm, which is focused on action. So what happens once the money flows? Um, and that's around impact reporting strategy and strengthening governance around deployment of capital. And really we see cities within the developing world as an especially critical touch point in the battle against um, climate change because of the rapid rates of urbanization. And indeed, green bonds are a very um, significant tool for combating uh, the, the um, climate change impacts that will be seen in cities. So to formalize um, a little bit and give us a, a starting point for unpacking the research recommendations, uh, our, our view on the green bond market to date, Around uh, 1.7 trillion has been issued uh, to date, according to the Environmental Finance Greens bond, Bonds Database, of which less than a quarter has flown to developing countries. 
Once we strip out China, which has got the largest green bond market by far amongst developing countries, only around 8% flows to the, re the rest of the developing world. So clearly a very small share, and particularly so if we think about the green bond market as being one of the mechanisms for enabling the flow of capital from the global north to the global south under the Paris Agreement. So certainly much more remains to be done in terms of unlocking the full potential of this um, exciting new market opportunity. But there are many developing economy challenges to developing green bond markets, which are quite well documented by now. Um, these include country risk and the cascading credit risk all the way down from the sovereign to all other issues within a particular market. So um, other issuers are generally rated lower than the sovereign on international credit rating indices. So essentially the rating of the sovereign uh, limits prospects for investment into all other um, issuers within a country. Secondly, local currency risk and volatility. So many international investors with large uh, wallets are unwilling to take local currency risk in developing countries because of fear of losing value. Thirdly, underdeveloped capital markets. This is particularly so on the African continent, which Joan has touched on. So very few really vibrant, liquid, well-functioning capital markets on the continent, bearing in mind that the green bond segment is just that. It's a segment within a capital market that must already be uh, functional for green bonds to take off. Um, also subscale bonds and issuers. So we generally see that bonds are far larger uh, in, in the developed world. There are some notable exclusions out of the larger economies like China and India. This is a problem because investors face higher transaction costs when they undertake due diligence on smaller scale bonds. There's also limited issue of credibility due to a, um, a less well-regulated environment. Um, this doesn't just pertain to capital markets, but also um, in a sense, the, the green projects which come through the pipeline into green bond use of proceeds. So there, are, there is less environmental data available, fewer certifications to signal the green credentials of the green assets. And that then also between these two factors creates some confusion with investors around whether the capital will flow to the intended uses and be properly allocated and reported on. And then finally, compounding all of these challenges, there are some market capacity gaps. Um, green bonds require the application of specialist skills, which are often not found domestically, and that international reliance then drives up costs for developing countries wanting to develop this opportunity. So what we noticed when we drilled down a, a level uh, is that not all developing countries have been equally challenged or, or, or equally um, hindered in their progress in developing green bond markets. And that in fact, we could segment the universe of emerging and developing economies into three. So we see a clear pool of leaders which have managed to um, issue at least $5 billion worth of green bonds to date. Um, this one does not contain China's issuance because it's so large, it dwarfs everything else and makes the, the graph um, appear a little strange. But China is in this group. Um, the other notable ones are India, Chile, Brazil, and Indonesia. Mexico, despite issuing more than $5 billion, more rightly fits within the follow group because this very large uh, $7 billion here was issued by a single agency. Um, related to an airport development, and that has not been very successful since. So we'll keep it in, in this followers group. So the leaders have, um, have developed quite vibrant green bond markets already. The followers have smaller green bond markets, but they see regular issuance. However, they still need to address some structural factors within their economies to realize the full potential of the larger ones. In certain cases, the size of their economy is also a limiting factor to, uh, to, to achieving the kind of assurance that the leaders have. And then the nascent markets, that's really a catch-all for the others which are still at a much earlier phase um, and have not yet um, achieved a, a regular um, kind of uh, going to market yet. So 
we saw amongst those that have been successful so far that there were really two strategies for catalyzing the markets adopted. Um, in certain cases, this was government-led, while in others, it was corporate-led. Um, the government-led strategies tended to take place within smaller and less well-developed capital markets, where uh, the governments would leverage their, their sustainability policy leadership to attract MDBs, DFIs, and IFIs as anchor investors into the green bond market. They would also then use their investment grade sovereign credit rating um, to attract global investor pools into the green bond issuance and raise debt in hard currency for local green project priorities. So it was important in all of the cases that these things um, uh, were present. The advantages of the government-led strategy is that they were able to attract concessional capital and FDI at scale for climate investments, including for non-commercial projects. So the advantage of, of government bonds issuing green bonds is that they, uh, of governments issuing green bonds is that they don't need to be only for commercially attractive projects like renewable energy projects. They were also able to bypass um, underdeveloped capital markets through private placements or listing on foreign exchanges. Cases where uh, we would say that the strategies for government led include Chile and Indonesia. On the corporate led side, these were usually better, um, more developed capital markets with larger economies and regular trading at activity by investors. Um, there were large private sector players who were able to develop commercially mature projects to serve as use of proceeds, and then generally some de-risking via some form of credit um, enhancement like a sovereign guarantee. So, for example, in India, the use of uh, sovereign guarantees on um, renewable energy power purchase agreements served as a de-risking strategy. The advantages of this um, in, of this particular strategy include less reliance on public subsidies or regulations to catalyze the market, um, a very rapid diversification of issuers as investors show interest, and then also rapid scaling of green bond markets. And this strategy has been particularly effectively employed among some of the leaders, including um, BRICS countries, India, Brazil, and China. So regardless of which pathway was taken to grow the markets, we noted that there needed to be four cornerstones in place in the foundation to achieve success. The first one was basic enabling policy and regulation. So this is a national commitment to sustainability consistent with NDCs promised by that country and capital markets regulation, which facilitates the development of a green bond segment. The second, uh, enabler is public sector support. So this is at the level of either building institutional capacity or transaction support. Public sector in this case referring also to DFIs, MDBs and IFIs. So play a very important cat catalytic role early on. Investor demand for green bonds has been important. So this does not refer only to local institutional investor demand or indeed international institutional investor demand but at least locating investors with a willingness to subscribe to early issuance, issuances. This can include then also um, some of the DFIs, MDBs and IFIs. And then finally, we noted that all of the leaders and followers had no more than moderate levels of country risk. So they were rated at double B or better. And that um, in-country stability laid a platform for the development of this segment within the green bond, within the bond market. So we've touched on public sector support and that can be in four different forms primarily. Um, at the very base of the pyramid is, is being a catalytic issuer. So sovereigns or local governments can become uh, quite uh, important signalers of intent within the green bond market either becoming debut issuers or uh, trialing new bond structures in the market, for example, asset-backed securities. They can also anchor invest and support book building. So this is really important for crowding other investors into third party issues. They can provide currency and credit risk management solutions. And this is particularly DFIs and MDBs to assist with de-risking uh, emerging market paper. 
and then they can provide technical assistance to issuers and regulators to enhance uh, market capacity to undertake this type of transaction. So moving then beyond just the foundations and looking at strategies for overcoming other typical challenges encountered in developing countries, the most prominent one that arises within the green bond space is underdeveloped capital markets. So we've already said that we need to have a functioning debt capital market to launch this green bond segment. Interestingly, several solutions have been developed to bypass the presence of imperfect capital markets. So this is not as large and, imp uh, and uh, higher hurdle as we might have thought it would be. The first one is the use of credit guarantees to de-risk bonds and attract international green bond investors. So we've spoken about some of the hurdles to attracting international capital when a sovereign is um, below investment grade. Credit guarantees issued by international entities with high credit ratings can solve this problem. A second strategy has been to issue in hard currency to access international capital markets. So for example, the Chilean government has issued a lot of paper in, in hard currency to access international green bond investors. So this is an effective way to tap those large international pools of capital. And then thirdly, private placements, which are arranged bilaterally, similarly to loans, also overcome the absence of trading activity within capital markets and can play a very important role in kickstarting green bond markets um, amongst others because they guarantee the issue of the green bond that there's demand at a pre-agreed price point which makes it worth their while to undertake the costs of green labeling. Beyond that then, we need to make sure that the project pipeline is adequate and that the costs of green labeling can be managed. So for, uh, for the market to develop interest in the green bond segment, it needs to have visibility into a steady pipeline of eligible green projects. This challenge has often been solved at a national level, either through a public private partnership program for large scale infrastructure delivery, or through creating a priority list of strategic green projects at a national level and making this visible to the market. So through creating a medium term uh, view of green projects to be undertaken within the country, institutional investors can gain visibility into the type of projects which they can invest in and then develop green bond capabilities around uh, future investment opportunities. The, uh, the next hurdle is costs of green labeling, which are generally borne mostly by the issuer Although for the investor, there are also additional due diligence challenges associated, particularly in relation to verifying the green credentials of the bond issuance. The way that this has been solved is to incentivize credible issuance in the early years, to encourage participants to learn by doing and gain the necessary skill sets. So particularly in Asian countries, um, various types of incentives have been advanced often to the issuer to support external review and absorb those costs, in certain cases also to investors in the form of tax incentives. And then finally, just speaking about some of the market challenges around uh, the broader issue of green bond markets not yet being standardized and formalized universally. Uh, the first hurdle is credibility or lack of credibility and the threat of greenwashing. Uh, we mentioned earlier that developing countries often have less well-developed regulation and green asset standards and certifications, which does pose a threat to, uh, to confidently developing green credentials. The, the main solution that has been found here is to focus nationally on strengthening those institutional and frameworks, including taxonomies and external review measures. So for example, tying incentives to external review, as well as making sure that local taxonomies are aligned with international definitions and good practice is a way to, to develop confidence domestically. And then in relation to fragmentation, it's also very important to explain to the international investor community why in certain cases it's necessary to depart from international guidelines. 
um, as well as to avoid unnecessary departures. So this is a case study for us looking at China specifically. This is um, annual issuance in the market between 2016 and 2020. And we can see how deviation from good practice in the form of inclusion of fossil fuels eventually led to declining investor confidence and a drop off in investment in 2020. So even despite the large market size that China has and a lot of international investment interest in the market, that lack of credibility ultimately created a lot of concern and withdrawal of investors from the market. India was one of the case studies that we dived into in greater detail, Kenya the other. Kenya is a very nascent green bond market, so I'm not going to speak about the lessons we can learn there yet. But India offers us an interesting case study because the green bond market is about seven years old there already. So to date, green bonds have raised around $16 billion for green projects in the country and attract a wider pool of investors per issue compared to conventional bonds by the same issuer. So they have really generated some impressive success within the country. We can also see that they've achieved an increasingly diverse um, issuer base over time with an equally broad investor base. Contributors have been an enabling policy and regulatory framework, massive investment by the government into renewable energy through um, an IPP program and hard currency assurance. Still, there are challenges to overcome. So there, there are restrictions on the ability of international investors to invest in India, as well as the institutional investors in the form of retirement funds, which are restricted to investments in AA instruments, which most of these green bonds are not, um, as well as a limited expansion beyond the renewable energy sector so we would recommend six things to Indian policymakers to expand potential further, and it will be great to hear Sandeep's commentary on some of these recommendations. So firstly, the Indian government has not yet issued at sovereign level, and this is a bypassed opportunity to raise capital for climate action while also signaling the commitment of government to its sustainability policy. This is particularly important for adaptation projects and those that are not likely to be undertaken by corporates. Secondly, that policymakers should consider mandatory disclosure of corporate climate risks to inform investment decisions. So at the time of the COP, the French government took a decision to require financial services uh, institutions to report on climate risks embedded within their portfolios. And that has led to a 40% reduction in investment in fossil fuels. The same thing could happen in India. Um, thirdly, we note that India does not yet have a green taxonomy, which could greatly um, facilitate investment, particularly outside the mainstream green bond use cases like renewable energy. Fourthly, that regulators could consider more rigorous external review um, protocols to improve the legitimacy of the Indian green bond market and to restore confidence um, to, to particularly um, non-public sector issuance. Fifthly, policymakers should consider reforming the capital markets regulation, which is currently hindering the flow of capital into green bonds, which we've touched on. More about that is available in the report. And then finally, that um, selective expansion of credit enhancement strategies could be particularly valuable for attracting more private capital into the space. Um, I believe that, uh, that the reports will be published um, shortly and we invite all of you to have a look at those and to get in touch with us. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear what you have to think. Thanks, Megan. Thank you for giving such a succinct presentation on a very complex um, topic. And I think it's uh, this is a good basis for uh, our, few, our uh, next speaker, Mr. Sandeep uh, Bhattacharya, um, who will be speaking with, uh, has joined in today. Um, Mr. Sandeep is from the Climate Bond Initiative, India Program Manager. His present role is that of market development, which includes establishing and enhancing relationships with various stakeholders, including banks, financial institutions, credit rating agencies, brokering firms, consultancy firms, educational institutions, 
and NGOs with the aim of looking at environmentally friendly assets uh, for the cap capital market. Um, he's also been involved as part of the development of the green bond market in Bangladesh, co-designing and executing training in, uh, workshops and also supporting impact uh, financial institutions with the first bond issuance in the distribution uh, in the looking at distributed energy renewable sector as well as designing a roadmap for green bonds uh, for Indian municipalities. Um, thank you very much uh, Mr. Sandeep for joining us today and um, over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, since Megan has said nearly everything that can be said about India, I don't know what I'm supposed to be saying. Uh, my my role has been rendered redundant, and this is a big complaint against you, Megan, that you have made me redundant. Yeah. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, uh, your slides were extremely well made. Uh, thanks, and uh, to compensate for that, I will not use any slides. You know, you have so you have put so much of work. I think I will take it that you know you have it's enough work for both of us combined. Uh, okay. So I'll respond to some of the points that uh, you brought up, uh, and you know, uh, you know the. Uh, I mean, I, I know a lot of foreigners don't want to listen to this, but uh, India is generally India means complexity, yeah, and it's extremely difficult to get to very neat ideas of. Uh, what exactly happened without a lot of full stop commas, ifs, buts, and all that. So the first thing I would say is, while currently, if you look at issuance use of proceeds, the private sector is overwhelmingly large. Yeah, uh, currently, if you look at use of proceeds, if you looked at the same in say 2017 or 18, the use of proceeds would be overwhelmingly public sector, with a few private sectors here and there. So uh, while the government itself has not stepped in as an entity, uh, from, you know, from what a lot of bankers tell me, it is the government which uh, kind of requested the public sector to kickstart the market by issuing green bonds. And that's, that's, that's what a lot of bankers tell me. Nobody has seen any communication to it, uh, but everybody believes that this is what happened. Uh, everybody feels that you know the public sector is not very easy to move by people like you or you, me, or even my CEO Sean Kidney. Yeah? They, they won't listen to any one of us. So if they came in such large numbers in 2015, 16, and 17, it it must have been some not an wing or maybe some even official communication from the government of India. Yeah, that's 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 what. <clears throat> so the government played a very vital role in kickstarting the market. <clears throat> As of now, the private sector has overtaken it. You know, the, the, the infrastructure has been created. Uh, so the bankers know, you know, what works, how much works, how much of capital is there in the West, uh, how much of dedicated green capital is there, and you know, they, they have made hay, hay out of it. <clears throat> 2021 was a breakout year, as you might have known, close to six billion issuances uh, in green and close to 10 billion if you combine you know, the, all the sustainability and all that stuff. And so that, that makes it around 25%, oh no, 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 40% of all offshore borrowings. So total offshore borrowings is 25 billion around. And out of that, close to 10 billion is green plus sustainability plus this, this social and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's been a quantum jump, uh, but the initial kickstarting was essentially done by a lot of public sector entities. Uh, the other point which on 21 was, is that uh, the, the thing, there was a municipal corporation bond, which is Ghaziabad Municipal Corporation in the state of Uttar Pradesh. So again, you know, Ghaziabad, while it's in a particular state, it actually mostly is a part of the national capital region. So New Delhi has grown and, you know, effectively you will find it a continuous landmass with New Delhi. It's, it's, it isn't exactly, you know, a separate town, but yeah, so it's it's the national capital region. It hasn't created a lot of uh, verb, it's a small issuance, but then there's a start. 
the sovereign green bond which you were talking about has been announced in the annual budget and you know the modality of of you know the modality of uh, the bond and everything is is going to get decided uh, and most probably you know i have heard bankers say that is going to come in 3q so currently the what should be the framework be what is the assets all those things are getting debated uh, and generally what we have seen is that most of this is uh, are assets which have already been financed yeah uh, so most of these are assets which have already been financed so generally that's how it comes and yes there are a lot of adaptation assets you know you can't ask a sovereign you keep the money you know in a separate bank account and disperse they, they generally won't agree so after the sovereign bond issuance we expect maybe some state government issuance going ahead but that i think will be after the sovereign issuance state governments have not made that much of move <clears throat> and uh, you know india has more than 3000 municipalities but unfortunately uh, overwhelming majority of them uh, as you know pratibha and team would know much better than me that they don't have they don't necessarily have great uh, great ability to maintain the accounts in a manner which the capital market demands maybe 10 to 15 half so outside of that you know we might have a few issuances from there but otherwise very unlikely so this is my submission uh, here and i'm open to questions Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Sandeep, for giving the reality and the true picture um, of the situation here in India. Um, Joanne, I think I'd now hand it over to you to uh, moderate the Q&A session. And if we have questions from the audience, um, please, um, you can maybe raise your hands and ask the question directly, um, or you may put it in the Q&A box. Um, so, yes, thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Jan, if you have any counter questions for Sandeep or Megan. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you very much to Sandeep uh, and Megan. I think that was a really um, insightful and, and interesting uh, set of presentations and reflections. And one of the big um, you know, asks, I think, across Africa is around the fact that we do need to strengthen the domestic capital markets. And, and that's, the real, that's the real challenge at hand, I think. Um, and there's a lot around educating investors, domestic and international, but particularly our domestic investors. Um, and I guess maybe I could throw back to you just that question around sort of when you were doing your study, what were the main sort of uh, you know, opportunities maybe, uh, let's try and look forward, uh, uh, opportunities around sort of investor education and, and where, are, where do you see are sort of like the hooks, um, things that will draw investors in? Because I think, you know, if you're unfamiliar with something, you know, what are the sort of incentives that either government or, you know, the market can put forward um, just to incentivize more uh, investors in this direction? Uh, so maybe I could throw that back to you, Sandeep and Megan, and then also say to the participants, please send your questions, um, post your questions up on the um, uh, the chat. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so it's for me, right? So uh, my view is, I I can't speak for beyond South Asia. So let me give that, uh, uh, you know, uh, disclaimer first. Mm, within India, what I can say is what will trigger a lot of action is something similar to what the SEC, you know, SEC of the US has recently done. It has mandated uh, certain disclosures. I, I don't know the details yet. I, I have not had the time to get through it. Uh, but what I see is an, uh, an equivalent move is going to move mountains uh, and you know there's some precedence here as megan mentioned after the paris accord uh, so megan mentioned a certain things which happened when, when less money went into fossil fuels and all that there's a lot more 
uh, which you know Paris, which is not exactly you know the 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 most uh, robust financial center, did have a lot of green finance transactions. So it's an entire ecosystem which went around because you know you have you're suddenly familiar with a lot of companies and you've grown up with them and suddenly you, you realize oops this company is doing so much of harm we i never knew yeah uh, which drives consciousness like nothing else and as you know in europe a uh, regulation is pretty light it's not much of regulation there so that is one thing which can help tremendously the second thing which can help is you know most as i mentioned earlier most indian issuances are offshore issuances yeah uh, why why is there so much of offshore issuances because there's dedicated green capital yeah yesterday night i was at a party of you know mm, which was to commemorate the second uh, large scale triple a local green bond in, in the in, in the local market from from again a, a renewable energy developer uh and what happens is you know an, even a large bond say 1 billion dollar bond which is originated in india and sold in uk or singapore the selling has all been offshore the awareness raising uh has all been done offshore not not within the investor community in india but these two bonds, one which was around 160 million and this was 192 million, these two have created tremendous amount of investor awareness. And if we can seed somehow through a multilateral, you know, some, some capital uh, which is dedicated to green causes, which invests in green bonds, this domestic trend will accelerate and it will have the positive feedback loops. You know, if the domestic trends happen, a lot more people come to know and then that drives more you know that 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 feedback loop is going to get so these are the two things i would put on the table first when these two things are there i think taxon uh, taxonomy can do a brilliant job without these two i'm not sure how much of a work uh, how much of an effect the taxonomy will have i think you have a, a, a really good point there megan anything to add I think that's um, I think that's very well covered. Um, and then just to add that, you know, in the early days of of uh, green bond markets, particularly where capital markets are underdeveloped or where there are regulatory restrictions limiting activity in in debt capital markets, a private placement can achieve great things for both the issuer and the investor. Um, around a quarter of, um, of green bonds issued in the Latin American and Caribbean regions are private placements. And although these look more like loans and therefore to an extent are less um, uh, desirable from a public sector viewpoint, they can establish the certainty that both parties to the transactions require to, uh, to, to you know, get that early deal flow happening. So from the issuer side, they can lock in a price concession, potentially, if they're placing with a public sector issuer for the first time, which makes it worth their while to undertake the extra efforts and incur the costs. From the investor side, they can ensure that the issuer is going to align with the investor's own sustainability goals, that the reporting is going to be in line with their requirements, um, so that they can report back to their key stakeholders in line with the indicators that matter mm. to them. And they can even consider um, inserting clauses into that bond um, agreement that penalize the issuer for failing to achieve what they set out to. So if the issuer subsequently uses the proceeds for non-aligned um, projects or they fail to report on how the money has uh, generated impact, that that can actually trigger a remedy for the investor, which may be either in the form of a higher coupon or immediate settlement of, um, of the outstanding debt. So that those initial bilateral transactions can really build confidence and bypass a lot of those challenges in, um, in debt capital markets where investor demand is uncertain. And then I, I think Sandeep has touched on the importance of tapping those international pools of capital 
um, which is possible through hard currency assurance. Um, in addition to that, I think it's important to bear in mind that there are also guarantee schemes like Garantco um, and catalytic green bond investors like the African Local Currency Bond Fund that are very eager to play um, credit enhancement functions for local currency bonds um, in, in particularly African countries. So where there's interest in, in issuing green bonds in these countries, I think really assembling that ecosystem from the start and including um, these key enabling institutions um, can make all the difference to bring something to market that is palatable to, to long-term investors. And then of course, I think across the board, um, really very little is done to, to uh, kind of match make the natural investors into these infrastructure bonds like um, retirement funds with the opportunities. So really our focus should be on educating um, the long-term investors with asset liability matching requirements about the benefits of green bonds, particularly to meet um, their cash flow needs. So um, showing them that a 10 or 15 year infrastructure bond with a green label can be um, more beneficial than, than you know, simply investing in three-year money or, or um, cash instruments and, and really using that longer term profile of a green bond to attract them into this new segment. Sandeep, you wanted to add, add something? Uh, not really. I, I, think this, okay. I think this is fairly extensive, nothing much more than that. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you so much for those great insights. I think I can take away needs assembly. I think that's, <laughs> that's really something that we should think about, about the Africa market. There are different stakeholders that we can try to tap into. Um, and um, in a nascent market like this, a lot of it has to do with that education uh, and getting the right um, stakeholders and players in the, at the same time uh, around the table so that you know some of these things can be done. Um, I think there's enough appetite within the market, certainly across Africa, uh, for this to happen. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of the assembly, as you said, Megan. I think that's a really good point. Um, and I'm looking at the, the chat, and there's a question here um, from Roy around, okay, so if this is all about the education and there's some significant education needs, then who are the players that we need to kind of partner with as um, the LEDS GP uh, and the Africa LEDS platform? Uh, in order to kind of advance um, that work. Well, um, I'm going to put a hand up immediately, Josh, and say we could probably do something as UNDP as well. We, we do have a suite of training, et cetera, but I'm sure others are available too um, for, that, uh, for that kind of a partnership. Um, any other sort of closing thoughts? I'm conscious of our time, and I think we, we've just gone five minutes over. Um, and maybe I can, I'm not seeing anything else in the chat and, and also noticing people starting to drop off. So maybe we can draw a line here. Um, any sort of part just comment from you? Yeah, I, exactly. I, I, just, uh, I just wanted to add actually, um, if Sandeep is still on the line, um, CBI has got some fantastic uh, green bond workshops and training materials. Sandeep, do you want to add anything on that? Yes, so we do a green bond training. It's a two-day training. We have done it online now. We have made it online now and we can deliver it anytime, anywhere. We hold regular sessions uh, uh, for say ASEAN timing, LATAM timing, Europe timing. Uh, and uh, very often, you know, uh, there are uh, there are particular entities like the CDC holding it for their internal stuff. Where you know I came in because they wanted to understand how how do we invest in green bonds in India. Uh, so there is a captive audience one, and there is also you know an open one. Uh, the Indian or the South Asian market is a bit price sensitive, so we don't get too much of subscription from there. Uh, but then we can get. Yeah, uh, so that's the situation. Yeah, 
so if those trainings are useful for the African market and anybody wants to you know hold a close to an internal one which is generally how it starts up then general interest comes and then you know the public ones go yeah so we we are we are there to do it fantastic back to you Pratima. okay thank you so much it was a quite an interesting conversation and i think we can follow up um on this in subsequent uh, sessions that we have um, I would just like to now quickly hand it over to my colleague um, Anandan to um, take over for the closing remarks. Thanks so um, much. Yeah. Thank you, Pradeepa. Hope I am uh, audible. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. Uh, we are already late by seven minutes. I will not take more than a couple of minutes. Um, here are a, a couple of uh, a few points before we close. Uh, the finance communities of practice is member driven and uh, uh, based on members' needs, uh, uh, we could organize further sessions, etc. Uh, so we request you take a, a very short survey at the end of this uh, webinar, where you can uh, provide inputs on the further needs uh, that uh, the uh, Asia and Africa partnership uh, should focus on. And um, we also encourage members to join the uh, finance communities of practice to get uh, regular updates. Uh, so we also provide technical assistance to developing countries. It's available at uh, free of cost and you could avail it. You could write it to LP Secretariat or Africa Secretariat and uh, get further information on how um, the needs could be supported by the partnership. Um, yeah, and, and of course, uh, on behalf of the organizing team, we immensely thank uh, uh, the speakers for today, Sandeep, Mehan, also Jovan for um, um, coordinating, moderating, and thank you all uh, the participants for attending today's session. Uh, we hope uh, you found it uh, very useful. And uh, does the uh, speakers have any final remarks that you want to add in uh, before we close? Okay, uh, if nothing else, I think uh, considering the time, uh, we would uh, close the session. And thank you all once again for joining the session. Have a great day ahead. Thank, Thank you, you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day.